Welcome, uh, everybody. So welcome to this, uh, this PWC Graduate Institute uh, breakfast event. Uh, the topic today is uh, impact evaluation. Let me introduce uh, our, our panelists. Uh, first of all, uh, we have one panelist who unfortunately will not be here today, who is Alain de Letros, uh, because he's suffering from the, uh, the effects of his uh, second uh, COVID shot. So that's that that's a shame. So we are we're, we we lose in some sense the uh, the, uh, the conflict and the uh, pr perspective that he would have brought. But uh, be that as it may, we have uh, we have a great lineup. So uh, first, let me introduce uh, Edith uh, Patouillard, uh, who's an economist at the WHO, who will give us uh, perspective in terms of uh, in terms of health uh, and in terms of a critical, to say the least, international organization in these uh, trying times. Uh, second, uh, we're going to have uh, Chandan Singh, who's joining us from India, who uh, is an impact evaluation specialist uh, working with, uh, with PwC, and who's going to bring, uh, among other things, as most of you know, uh, there's there huge impact evaluation issues to be dealt with uh, in India. So it'll give us both the perspective, the Indian perspective uh, and different sectoral perspectives because he has vast experience uh, in, uh, in, in this area. Uh, we also have uh, Anaïs Pabret de la Rochefort-Dair from uh, PwC who's here. Uh, and uh, myself, I'm your, I'm your host. Uh, my name is Jean-Louis Arcan, Professor of uh, Economics at the Department of International Economics uh, here at the Graduate Institute, and uh, I've done quite a few uh, impact evaluations using various methodologies in a whole bunch of countries over the past 20 years. And so uh, the way in which things are going to work, we're going to have uh, initial presentations by uh, the three, the three uh, topical panelists. Um, in their respective uh, spheres of, uh, of, 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 of interest. Um, I'm going to ask them some questions, put them on the hot seat. Uh, but the, uh, the main thing here is participants is the, is the participation from the audience. So please use uh, the, uh, the, the chat uh, to uh, ask questions. I will uh, note down your, 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 your questions and uh, then ask them uh, of the uh, ask pose those questions to the um, to the panelists. Right now, I see on the screen we have uh, ninety four people, ninety five. It's sort of it's sort of clicking up. Uh, there's uh, more than two hundred and fifty people who are signed up. Uh, but please, uh, if you have questions as we go along, uh, simply uh, use the chat, and I will do my very best. To then bring your questions to our panelists. Uh, at the end of this session, uh, what I'll do is I'll give you some some more logistical information because this is being recorded. We're see we're up to 105 now, um, and uh, so I'll give you some information on where you can get the the, the recording, which will be on the. Might as well tell you right away. I'll remind you at the end. It's the Graduate Institute's YouTube channel. So without further ado, let's jump right into this. Uh, the pros and cons of impact evaluation. Why is it important? Should we do it? Should we not do it? How should we do it? Uh, and 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 what are the what are, what are the, the also the we'll, we'll talk about methodology as well. But let's get a, a an initial policy perspective right away. So over to you, Edith. Thank you, Jean Louis, and uh, greetings to uh, to everyone. Um, so. Um, before joining WHO, I worked uh, more than 10 years at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, where I led the impact and economic evaluations of uh, public health policies uh, in collaboration with the uh, ministries of, um, of health. So I've worked uh, and lived in uh, several countries in Africa, uh, so Zambia, Iswatini, Tanzania, and also lived and worked um, uh, with ministries in Southeast Asia in, uh, in Cambodia. Um, so I joined the WHO in 2014 as a health economist, uh, so first in the Global Malaria Program, and since September uh, last year uh, in the Economic Evaluation and Analysis Unit of the Health System um, Governance and Financing Department. In this unit, uh, I lead the work on health and the economy, 
uh, and we develop uh, guidance uh, and tools to support uh, member states uh, during resource allocation and prioritization and looking at outcomes so beyond the uh, beyond health outcomes and beyond the health sector. Um, in the COVID-19 context and in collaboration with the OECD and the World Bank, uh, we developed uh, end of last year a framework to, to support countries uh, on how to control transmission uh, and protect the health system so the, during, during the pandemic. Um, we've also, I mean, we are also conducting uh, integrated epidemiological and economic modeling uh, in selected countries. Uh, and in collaboration with ministries, so ministries of health, uh, the Treasury, Ministry of Finance, and this to measure the impact of introducing and lifting restrictions on movements and gatherings uh, in the context of uh, COVID-19 vaccination rollout. Uh, and I'm also working on methods to estimate the cost of um, health emergency preparedness, both at global and, and country levels. Um, so today I'm going to um, so to relate the uh, impact um, evaluation with some of the work that um, so that that I've mentioned just now. Um, so there are different meanings of impact in the general uh, evaluation literature um, from a contemporary definition. So it refers to a causal mechanism, right? So the change of an outcome by a particular program or intervention. Um, and so this morning, I will talk about so the methods to, that have been uh, so developed uh, and we are supporting countries to implement those methods to evaluate the intended but also non-intended impact of interventions that have been implemented to control um, COVID-19 transmission and protect um, the health systems. Um, so we focus on public health interventions. So as Jean-Louis said, you know, taking like the health sector perspective, uh, but those public health interventions have not been all uh, implemented in the health sector. So if I take an example, for example, stay at home orders or um, closing schools and businesses um, were public health interventions, but they were implemented outside the health sector and this to protect lives again and reduce the risk of overwhelming health systems. While vaccination uh, actually may be seen as an economic intervention uh, because it enables the reopening of economies by lifting restrictions and um, the, the restart of, the, uh, of, um, of, of economic activity and, and social interactions. So overall, the theory of change, we could say, seems to be relatively straightforward. Um, so we have interventions such as movement and gathering restrictions that have been introduced so to reduce the risk of acquiring and spreading infection with COVID-19 in different community settings and to reduce the risk um, of overwhelming the health systems. So, but why is the risk of infection of COVID-19 decreases? Um, restrictions also exacerbate the slowdown of economic activities and can have detrimental impact on equity and socioeconomic inequalities. So overall, there are important unintended consequences that need to be considered when evaluating uh, impact of particular interventions. So in our case, or in this example, um, there could be, or there was, uh, unintended consequences on non-COVID-19 health status. So for example, mental health or access to essential services. And in terms of social economic status, there was a clear reduction in the number of hours worked, uh, reduced income um, in some countries where um, financial protection coverage is, is, is relatively low or where the informal sector um, is, is large. And as observed globally, really a reversal in gains of poverty reductions that have been, that have been achieved uh, over the past decades. And so some debates have framed uh, this situation in terms of um, a trade-off between uh, lives on one side and livelihoods on the other side. And so at WHO, we argue that lives and livelihoods really go together. And so the impact of control measures require evaluation methods that integrate multiple outcomes. Uh, and this is particularly relevant because the state of livelihoods is also closely correlated with health status, access to care and to services and, and financial protection. Uh, so, impact evaluation should consider not only uh, also what works and why it works, uh, but also, sorry, why it works. Um, and this, part, um, this points to the importance of context. Um, in terms of the context, so the pandemic was actually associated with changes in individual behavior. Um, so, there is evidence uh, that the economic slowdown um, that has been measured by various indicators, um, such as so the mobility, uh, credit card transactions, for example, uh, had started before the introduction of, um, of restrictions such as like lockdown, for instance. 
And presumably this reflected change, so in individual behavior uh, due to the fear of infection uh, and in the context of, of uncertainty. Um, and the control of COVID-19 uh, has also been characterized by a sentiment of uh, pandemic fatigue uh, induced by the duration and the stringency of, of restrictions. And there is some indication that this fatigue um, has affected the effectiveness of control measures in some settings. For instance, uh, it has been observed that the adherence to face masks, uh, for instance, in some settings was actually relatively low um, at the beginning and even uh, in the middle of, uh, of 2020. And so, and in addition um, to another factor that, that affects um, so the effectiveness of measures and also the way that uh, you need to measure their, their impact, is the way that so measures and restrictions um, have been communicated or are being communicated by policymakers. And this alongside uh, to, the to the communication on the process uh, that has been used to take those decisions. For instance, the degree of uh, stakeholder participation uh, this has also affected the way that uh, those measures, those, those restrictions have been received by the public and thereby also affected the effectiveness of measures. Um, and we have witnessed some public debates concerning the lack of transparency in some of the decisions uh, taken and a lot of uh, you know, unfairness around, uh, around those restrictions. So the, co the causal pathways between uh, intervention and impact appear to be much more complex um, and it's really influenced by the implementation context and also the failures of interventions and the way that, they, that those interventions or measures have been designed and the way as well that they are communicated to the overall public. So it's really important to think about okay, the what but also the, the how. Um, so calibrating uh, control measures um, in terms of COVID-19, but also certainly in terms of other uh, pandemic is, is quite complex because it has a direct and indirect um, impact in terms of health and socioeconomic status, poverty, access to care. Uh, and this impact is really going to differ across different populations in now, but also in the future. And it's really characterized by the uncertainty, uh, by the urgency of the situation, and by really the need for multiple levels of decision making. Um, so in this type of context, we can think that there is, um, so there is no right or wrong answer and no one size fits all strategy. Um, what, we are, what we argue is for really like an inclusive decision making um, that is going to be systematically informed by data and communicating re regularly and clearly to promote transparency in the process and increase the legitimacy of, of decisions, of, of interventions that are going to be implemented and to promote the trust of the population um, in, in decision makers. So at WHO, uh, so we've developed this program of work to support uh, decision makers to so evaluate the impact of their policy choices uh, in terms of increasing the stringency of, uh, of control measures lifting also those control measures and this in the context of different uh, vaccination uh, administration rate and, and prioritization strategies uh, and looking at um, so having this this program of work that supports decision makers looking at uh, so the impact of uh, so the interventions but also the overall context on both health, health outcome and socioeconomic um, outcomes and so we work with member states and academic partners on integrated uh, epidemiological um, and economic modeling. Uh, so the, as the counterfactual, uh, so we draw on uh, say GDP projections um, from the pre-COVID-19 period. So in some ways, we could say that we are using this quasi-experimental de experimental design. Um, so we take advantage of the phased implementation of control measures throughout, uh, you know, I mean, since the start of, of, of 2020 because it provides variations in the duration and the stringency of interventions and their impact on health and, um, and economic outcome. Um, and we support um, the participation of member states uh, in the generation of this evidence, so in the modeling exercises, as well as supporting them in the translation of the, of the use of the data generated for policy use. And we also encourage the involvement of a wide range of stakeholders, uh, both for the interpretation of the findings, but also for their triangulation. Um, and the evalu this evaluation process is also the opportunity to really learn uh, 
adjust uh, measures, so accordingly, depending on the actual intended, but also unintended impact that those measures may have. And also, uh, given the change in the, um, for example, in the transmission uh, situation, as we see that um, um, they, they are like uh, continuous uh, ch changes with, um, you know, the, the, the variants, for instance. And so to conclude, and uh, so having taken the example of of, um, of the work that we are doing uh, in terms of controlling COVID-19 and, and supporting member states to so evaluate the, uh, the impact of their policy choices, um, I've got um, so yeah, five like general points um, that maybe can be discussed whether or not they are uh, probably applicable to other sectors as well. But it's really about the need to develop uh, so a good theoretical understanding of the change mechanism. So this theory of change that may be more complex than um, we think. Um, really about addressing the risk of the implementation failure. So thinking about the process evaluation. Um, so, so learning uh, as we go and really assess the situation uh, regularly based on the new evidence that may that may emerge. Um, we also recognize so, the very high level influence of uh, individual behavior um, and the design of studies that collect this related evidence around, um, around how individual behavior may change. So not only because of interventions, but also because of like broader uh, factors. And also need to adapt uh, to, or to, to adopt multiple uh, outcome measures. So in our case, we use both so COVID-19 health um, impact the non-COVID-19 non health um, outcomes, as well as more like socioeconomic um, uh, status outcomes, and, and, and really think about those in, unintended consequences of intervention. And thinking about the local adaptation as well of uh, impact evaluation methods, um, as we see that uh, in, in, in some countries, there may be already some modeling taking, you know, being, being, being used, or maybe no capacity at all to, to do that. So, other kind of of of, um, of methods may need to um, may, may 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 need to be really may need to be used, um, and and that overall there is no really like a one size fits all approach, and that, and that the context is um, needs to be taken into account during the um, the evaluation uh, the impact evaluation process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Edith. You covered an awful lot of ground there, uh, elicited a number of questions that we'll get back to uh, later, uh, and which will also allow me to jump in on various things that you uh, that, that you brought up. Um, Chandan, you want to you want to jump in now? Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks, Professor. Good morning, everyone. Chandan Singh, I'm an economist by training and and uh, impact evaluation practitioner. So I will talk more uh, from the perspective of a practitioner. So as an impact evaluation practitioner, I design research methodology for impact evaluation. I design survey questionnaire, pilot them, oversee data collection processes, and then analyze data and communicate the finding to a large number of stakeholders. I have experience of uh, using uh, experimental and quasi-experimental and non-experimental research design for impact evaluation. I will highlight some of the uh, impact evaluation study that I have conducted in India and uh, African countries. One of them was the uh, impact evaluation of microfinance loan, which uh, which aimed to improve uh, economic well-being of the uh, people receiving microfinance loan in India and Ghana. In that study, we used uh, quasi-experimental design, which basically means to have a treatment group and a control group design. Recently, I uh, laid an impact evaluation of skill development program, which aimed to improve employability of uh, youth in India. The study was conducted uh, in one of the Indian states. And in this study, the outcome indicator was employability. So generally what happens in labor market, all skilling programs or active labor market programs, they aim to increase your chance to get a job. Uh, but the job scenario depends on demand side factor also. It's, it's not always uh, right to attribute that you will get the training and you receive the training, you pass the training course and you will get a job because job depends on many other factors in the economy also. So it may not be a justice to you know, say that uh, your program has failed because after uh, receiving the program, people were not employed. So what we did in this context that we designed an index which basically measure employability level of participant. So we measure impact 
on employability index, not on job outcomes. So again, it was a treatment control group design where uh, we, we we had opportunity to uh, build a strong counterfactual and we tried matching methods to ensure that the groups are similar so that we can we can try to answer the question of attribution in this study. I have also been engaged by uh, private clients to measure impact of their projects as a part of a corporate social responsibility. So in India, the corporates are required to spend 2% of their profit on social development programs. So they generally uh, expect uh, us to carry out evaluation for their projects. Uh, but uh, for corporate clients, uh, generally typical impact evaluation method like quasi-experimental or experimental or non-experimental design may not work or because they, they like to understand return on investment. For them, it is always return on investment. So they, they like to understand, I invested this amount of money, so what happened to my money in terms of return? So for them, we use uh, methods like social uh, return on investment, SROI, so which is not a purely impact evaluation method, but it tries to somehow get the picture that what happened to their intervention. So I was also engaged by uh, private client on this uh, kind of uh, evaluation studies. So as we progress today, I will be uh, sharing my experience on how to implement uh, impact evaluation at the ground level, what are the challenges we face, and also we can uh, throw some perspective whether every program should be evaluated or is it uh, I mean, should the particular program should be evaluated or should every program should be evaluated? When we should think about evaluation, should we think about evaluation as soon as we think of the project or should we think about evaluation later on once the project has matured? What are the challenges we face at the ground level, right? And should impact evaluation just focus on measuring change on outcome or should it also focus on understanding how those change were achieved so that when we communicate the finding to the stakeholder or bureaucrats, we should be able to make them understand that, okay, if there is a change, this change is because of this channel. If there is no change, then this is not, this is why the change has not occurred. So, which means impact events should include process evaluation, assessment of monitoring data, and other, uh, other evaluation design or mechanism so that we can provide a comprehensive picture that, okay, this is the impact and this is why it has occurred. So, we will touch upon that also. We will also uh, talk about that impact evaluation should include cost effectiveness because impact evaluation should just not tell you whether impact has, had happened, but it should also tell you that, okay, this was an effective uh, program and with uh, no optimum amount of money, we should uh, we achieve that outcome. So we, I will be touching on uh, these aspects as we progress. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Chandan. That was that, that was great. Let me let me just take a step back here. Uh, we have a number of questions in the in 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 the chat. Uh, I'll get to those uh, in a little bit. But let me take a step back here because typically at these uh, this type of event we have a very diverse audience, and so uh, both uh, Edith and Chandan, you're using some terms that some of our audience may not be uh, familiar with. So let me just set the scene for some of the people who are who are who are watching us. So that we get a common vocabulary in some sense uh, together. So, first of all, uh, again, I apologize for people who are practitioners who, who know this stuff, you know, like the back of their hand, but uh, I want to just make sure that everyone's up to speed. Apologies, this is sort of the academic, you know, teacher in me uh, speaking. So, first of all, what do we mean by impact evaluation? Because there's a lot of people throwing around this term impact evaluation. Uh, and uh, one way of answering the question is, I know it when I see it, but that's not a very satisfying answer to that. So, um, the, the basic point here, and this is a term that both uh, Edith and Shandon have been using, you have an impact evaluation if you have a counterfactual. So, what does counterfactual mean? So, there are various ways in which I always try to explain this. Uh, one way of, of, of thinking about this is you think of an impact evaluation. So let me show my age here. Um, I'm going to show my age by, by quoting the original Star Trek. Uh, apologies for the non North Americans. This was a very famous, uh, there's been a whole bunch of versions of this, but let me take the, the original version, you know, the original TV series, which wasn't much of a, of a success. There's a famous episode where Kirk, who's one of the heroes, is really nasty in a parallel universe. He's a nice guy, he's the good guy in the usual universe. 
And in the usual universe, Spock is logical. Uh, and in the alternative universe, he's not. Okay, he's completely illogical. So what we're trying to do essentially in an impact evaluation is what? We're trying essentially to have two parallel universes, one in which we have the same children in the same households in the same villages with the same rainfall with the same, you know, political situation, et cetera, with a program that we're trying to evaluate, program, project, intervention that we're trying to evaluate. And then our counterfactual is exactly the same setup, but where the only difference is that the program, project, or intervention does not exist. And of course, this is science fiction, right? We can't have this. We can't simultaneously observe the same children, households, villages, whatever, with and without the program. Why is this conceptually extremely important? Because it shows you how difficult it is to actually do this properly. Because you're essentially, it's a question of attribution. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to identify a needle in a haystack. The world is a complicated place, and this is very difficult to do. And as you will notice, if you, if you follow any type of media, politicians don't understand this. They're continuously saying, oh, you know, the good job situation in, in country X is because I did such and such a thing, whereas quite often it's simply something that came from his or her predecessor, right? So attribution is very, very, very difficult. So that's the first thing. Just if you don't have a counterfactual, if you don't have a good counterfactual, you don't have an impact evaluation and your impact evaluation is only as good as is your counterfactual. Let me give you like a, 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 a current example of this. So last year, there was this very uh, visible paper done by uh, on COVID-19, on COVID looking, looking at the effect of various interventions. So it was published by uh, the Imperial College Group. So this is Ferguson, the people who were advising the British government initially on, on what was going on uh, in, 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 in the UK. And so they, they did, in some sense, an impact evaluation. It isn't, a, it isn't the type of methodology that we're really talking about, but they used an epidemiological model, and they, what they were trying to do was to construct the counterfactual to see how many lives had been changed. This was back in May 2020. How many lives had been saved by government interventions? Okay? And in their counterfactual, what they were doing is that they were assuming no change in behavior in the absence of the government interventions. For me, this was just like a, a stupid counterfactual. So given that in their counterfactual, there was no change in behavior whatsoever, they got huge numbers in terms of the number of lives that were being saved, probably a lot larger than they actually were. But the whole point is your impact evaluation is only as good as your counterfactual is. We'll get to the methods in a second. I see more questions appearing here in terms of in terms of uh, on, on the chat in terms of in terms of counterfactual. So that's so that's the first thing. Counterfactual. Second thing, you will get a reaction of a lot of people, especially people who, which is completely understandable, especially for people who work in extremely poor countries, and uh, the, when you're dealing with, with with extremely poor countries, who say, well, why should I actually spend money on this? Why should I spend any resources on an impact evaluation in an extremely poor situation? Okay, so, you know, I've, I've done impact evaluations in refugee camps in Chad uh, or in uh, CAR. Okay, so it's as, poor, as poor as it gets. Personally, let me give you my personal view. My personal view was always before taking on some sort of impact evaluation to calculate how much it was going to cost and are the returns, what we learn from the evaluation in terms of how it improves policy, how, you know, how many schools are we not going to build or how many dispensaires are we not going to build if we do this impact evaluation? And is the information and the value of the information we're going to get out of that, is it greater than whatever the cost is? Okay. But let me just give you a, 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 a sort of a, a, a pitch in terms of social responsibility. I've often been told, especially in African settings, ah, oh, no, you're, the methodology that you're proposing is too, is too complicated. And we'll get back to methodologies later. My personal view is the poorer the situation, the poorer the context in which you're doing the impact evaluation, the more rigorous your impact evaluation should be. Why? Let me give you an example. Suppose that you're going to evaluate a program in, in Switzerland, in, in, in the canton. You're looking at some sort of social intervention. If that program doesn't work, if it's a failure, how many children are going to die? 
Well, probably none. We're talking about Switzerland. Nobody's going to die. But if you're doing, if you're, if you're looking at a program in Mali or Burkina Faso, you know, some of my favorite countries, I don't want to make, uh, you know, je veux pas faire de jaloux, but I mean, these are countries I absolutely love. But they're very poor countries. If your program is not working, you're killing children. So the social responsibility, sort of the, the, the moral imperative to evaluate things, again, feel, you know, anyone in the audience, feel free to disagree with me. But the moral imperative for me in terms of rigor is much greater in situations of poverty than in situations of wealth. So I, for, for me, you have more of a social responsibility to do impact evaluations in situations of poverty than in situations of wealth. Final point before I then turn it back to the to the uh, to, to the panelists because I certainly don't want to monopolize the uh, time here. Um, in terms of methods, okay. So again, again for the people in the audience who 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 see these these terms flying around, let's just get again come back to this this common vocabulary. A lot of the vocabulary that impact evaluation specialists use is vocabulary essentially that comes from the medical profession. Okay. So impact evaluation is not something new. It's been around for close on to a century. The methods that we use, most of them, not all of them, but most of them have been around for at least half a century. So you've heard two terms which have been used here. You've heard the term experimental evaluations versus quasi-experimental evaluations. Okay. So let me just give you like the, you know, the, the two minute catch up class on, on, these, on, on these methods. So experimental methods, as the terminology says, that you run an experiment, okay? So this is typically, for example, again, in, the, in, in what's going on currently. So you'll have Pfizer or Moderna basically running an experiment where you randomly, so when we talk about experimental methods, it means it's an RCT. An RCT is a randomized controlled trial, okay? This is the standard terminology. Everyone uses this terminology. So basically you randomly assign people into treatment and control groups, okay? Uh, you randomly assign them into treatment and control groups. Economists actually do this in this very simplistic fashion. People who do serious RCTs, and there are some economists who do serious RCTs, you actually usually have three groups. You have treatment, control, and placebo. Okay, because as most of you probably know or have read, sometimes placebo effects, the simple fact of being treated by, for example, by a drug or actually by a placebo, which is the drug without the active chemical, you know, the molecule in it, you can actually get what are known as treatment effects. You can have a positive effect from a drug, even though you're getting a placebo because you think you're getting a drug. Okay. But that's experimental. It's an experiment. Okay. So those are the experimental methods or RCTs. On the other hand, you have quasi-experimental methods, and there are four of those. There's not three, there's not five, there's four. There always have been four, and there always will be four. So those four methods are basically matching methods of some kind. Okay? So basically, where on the basis of observed characteristics, sometimes this is called propensity score matching, but there's genetic matching, there's all sorts of methodologies, but you basically use the characteristics of individuals when I say individuals, it's in the statistical sense. So it can be children, households, villages, countries, whatever. Basically to construct an identical twin. Okay. So again, this is in this whole concept of a counterfactual. Another way of thinking it is that it's what you're trying to do is a twins experiment. What you, and I'm not talking about that horrible film, you know, with Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger from a few years back. Actual monozygotic twins. And what you want is of these two twins, one is treated by the program. That's the terminology that we use, the medical terminology that even economists use. And the other twin is untreated because there, you know, the genotype is the same in the two. So you're controlling for everything. Okay. So matching methods, essentially based on people's observed characteristics, their age, their ethnic group, the, where they live, the characteristics of the village, where they live, et cetera, you create your counterfactual based on observed characteristics. Okay. This of course has the weakness that there may be unobserved characteristics which are correlated with what's known as treatment status. Treatment status means getting the program versus not getting the, the program. Okay, so again, translation, treated individuals are people who get the program or the intervention. Untreated individuals are those who do not. In experimental methods, that's determined by flipping a coin. 
intuitively speaking. Okay, so back to the non-experimental methods, the four. One, matching, some sort of matching. Two, what's known as RDD. So what is, what is this shahabia, as the one would say in French? RDD is regression discontinuity design, okay? So economists, quote, discovered this in 1999. Political scientists have been using it since 1963. So as usual, as economists, we're always late. Uh, in terms of actually understanding stuff. But RDD is a very useful method because the way it works is quite often treatment status, whether you get a program or not, it depends on some bureaucratic rule, okay? So for example, you get a scholarship if your score, your test score on such and such a thing is greater than some threshold, okay? Or you get an anti, you, you're allowed to participate in an anti-poverty program if your income is below some threshold level, okay? so. So that statistically we can exploit this threshold because people near the threshold, just to one side and to the other, some of the people are treated, the other half of the people are not treated. They're basically statistically the same, both in terms of observables and unobservables. So that's the second method, RDD. Third method is essentially using panel data. So using panel data, the, the term which is quite often used is DID, difference in differences. So basically what we do is we follow groups of people treated people and the untreated people, we follow them over time, okay? and we look at the difference in the change in whatever outcome is, so, you know, their, their health, uh, their income, their employability, whatever the outcome, were, we look at the, the, the difference in the change between the treated and untreated group. Later on, I'll give you some examples of where this actually solves, solves the problem. And the fourth method, is what's known as instrumental variables, which is not used that much these days, but it's actually a very powerful econometric tool and you actually have to understand things. Basically, instrumental variables means you have to find some factor which affects treatment status, some characteristic, for example, of the village, of the child, of the family, which affects treatment status, so whether you get the program or do not, but which doesn't have a direct effect on outcome. So. Well, if, if anyone in the audience wants to hear more about this later on, I can get into this in more detail, but just to summarize, we have experimental methods. Those are RCTs, they're experiments, okay? Either two groups, treatment control, or three groups, treatment control, treatment placebo and control. And then we have quasi-experimental methods. There are four of those, which are halal or kosher. Uh, and the four of those are matching methods, difference in differences, regression discontinuity design, and instrumental variables. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna move back now uh, to, uh, to Edith. We have a, um, a, a bunch of questions which are, which, which, which are coming in. Uh, in particularly, uh, we have questions. So let me start off right away with the, with the first questions which were from uh, Leon Kim. Uh, who's at uh, who's who's at IOM? So uh, she was talking about asking about methodologies. So hopefully I I answered her in terms of the methodologies. Uh, Edith can get into some of the the specific methodologies that they're using uh, at uh, at WHO. I don't know if you want to if you want to elaborate on the on the on the methodologies that you've been using at WHO. That was that that's one of the first questions we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I mean. I guess it's one of the, um, so in, in all, uh, all countries, nearly all countries have, uh, you know, so use some kind of data to, you know, to take, uh, to take decisions on what kind of interventions to, to put in place. Um, so sometimes they, most of the time they looked at, uh, you know, like we restrict, we put restriction in place um, to protect the population and uh, we see what happens on the health outcomes. Uh, and then after you will look at what is the impact once those uh, restrictions are being put in place, then you look at what is the impact in terms of your social economic activities, for instance, and you put in place some mitigation um, strategies um, so as to um, yeah so as to mitigate the so the impact that those health interventions have had on um, your economic activity. But it's really rare that the two are being combined so that you actually look at what is the impact of um, a particular measures on both health and um, say like livelihood, you know, the capacity of, of people to, to live their lives. Um, and so we, what's happening is that we are integrating 
Uh, so it's one approach. Huh? It's not. Uh, I'm not talking from like a normative that it is the approach or the gold standard to use, but it. But it's trying to have the. Not, not having having the methods that are not like in siloed, uh, like maybe some discussions uh, may have had, you know, that you look at the health sector and then you look at the impact that's what happened on the economy. So it's really to try to develop methods, uh, and we do that in, in collaboration with academic partners, actually, to develop methods that integrate. So um, that integrate both like an epidemiological model where you look at the impact of, uh, of a measure on the transmission of the virus, on the number of um, death um, or the number of you know the hospitalization rate. If you look at you know you want to assess how much your your health system is going to be protected or or on opposite overwhelmed, and then we merge that this epidemiological model with um, a macroeconomic model that in some instance can be like a can be like a computerized generable model or it can be uh, one that is yeah based on like an input output. Um, so basically, like a sectoral economic uh, model, where you actually dis you model your your economy um, by you know by dividing it into sectors and by having relationships between different sectors and through like the supply chain as well, and and so it's really about trying to get multiple outcomes being assessed through like a common basically framework, um, and maybe I can come to the challenge after. Obviously, it's not you know it looks it looks. Um, it's attractive, but obviously it's data, you know, it's data intensive and, and method intensive. So, um, so there is also a lot of work to, to do around like the, you know, the, the data um, that you need to actually feed, uh, feed those kind of models. Um, and maybe just to cite one would be not in all countries, you will have, um, you know, hospital capacity, you know, having like the number of beds uh, that are available in hospitals, not all countries have this kind of data and you do need to have those kind of data to feed into your epidemiological model. And you also need to have for both the epidemiology uh, and the transmission, you also need to have some data on, con on contact rates, um, because this is what's going to inform the intensity of the transmission and contact rates. Um, so not only in terms of the mobility data, you know, that maybe like Google um, or Facebook, you know, have been tracing um, last year that have been very helpful, but that doesn't tell you really in, like in different sectors and depending on People's occupation, you know, how much contact, uh, and so what is the risk of, of getting COVID-19? So obviously, so one of the challenge of using, you know, those like so modeling data and uh, modeling um, approaches is that obviously you need to have the data to uh, to feed that. So one approach that we are hoping that this actual current work and what has happened with the COVID-19 pandemic is going also to. Um, raise awareness about you know the importance of data you know of surveillance systems and and of data that you actually require to you need to have data um, to be able to uh, to inform what kind of interventions you need to uh, to implement and then to, uh, to to evaluate thank you thank you very much edith uh there's uh we've partially answered some questions that mm -hmm. uh, kim was asking then, and by the way, I apologize if I butcher your name uh, when 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 pronouncing the the, the names of people. So uh, uh, please do not be offended uh, if I if I if I do not pronounce it correctly. So we we also have a question from uh, Kamolidin uh, Diyarov uh, on uh, designing treatment and control. We'll probably get back to that. So apologies if we don't like. There's a there's a specific there are two specific questions for Chandan here in terms of the the basically rates of return. And what, what you mean in terms of social rates of return, this comes from both Leon Quing and uh, Kim, excuse me, and from Matteo Guidotti. There, I, I speak Italian, so I'm not going to butcher uh, his name. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So, uh, I mean, as I said, the, the corporate world, they, they are more interested in knowing return. So that's the language they understand. So when we conduct impact evaluation for them, so they would like to understand whether their intervention or their money has resulted in some return. So again, we try to use impact evaluation concept while measuring those returns. So what we do is that we try to understand social, economic, and environment benefit of the program. And then we monetize them using proper, uh, there are methods to monetize economic benefits, social benefits, environment benefits. Basically it's a cost benefit analysis. So we monetize them and then we divide them by cost. But again, so this is a simple return, but while doing SROI, there are, Two, three factors we also consider. So one of them is 
to ensure that entire return is because of the program. So we try to include attribution factor there. So there are three concepts basically. One is attribution. So while measuring uh, social, economic, environment return, we try to understand are there any fa other factors which would have contributed to outcome. So those has to be negated from the analysis. Then there is a dead weight, which basically, even without your uh, intervention, there would have been some natural growth in the outcome. So that also needs to be accounted from your uh, analysis. And then there is a displacement effect. So the displacement effect is basically, if someone is getting benefited from your program, does it mean that someone is not getting benefited? For example, let's say that I train somebody in a skill uh, by providing the skills, then the person get a job. So does it mean that that person has captured a job which would have been taken by someone else? This is very different to actually analyze while doing this, but these are three things we consider while measuring SROI. So this basically takes care of attribution part. So then when you get the return, it is basically return of the project. So this is one of the method we generally use for evaluation of uh, private client interventions, not a uh, government development uh, no intervention. I hope I could explain. Thanks a lot, Chandan. That, 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 that's great. So we have a whole bunch of other uh, of, of other questions here. Um, so there are questions about ethics, uh, which as economists, we are singularly unequipped to, to deal with. But let me just take that one, because that's actually a very important question. Uh, some people, so, so I'm, again, I've got into trouble by criticizing experimental methods. I do, I do RCTs, uh, but I've got into trouble. But in some sense, from the ethical standpoint, there are people who criticize RCTs uh, and say, how can you deny treatment to people? Well, in the medical profession, when one does an RCT, um, one of the quote, problems, unquote, is that because of ethical concerns, it's very difficult to actually have an, a, re, a, a real control group because for ethical reasons, one actually has to give all sorts of alternative treatments to people in the control group for ethical reasons. Let me just give you a, a very simple reason why actually an RCT may be the most ethical way of doing things. Uh, given that normally you don't have the resources to quote treat everybody uh, with a program, inter you know, project or intervention, what's more ethical in terms of denying people treatment? Flipping a coin or giving the treatment to people who happen to be the cousin of the person implementing the program? Okay, I rest my case. Okay, so in, in, in that sense, Ethically speaking, an argument can be made that an RCT is actually the most ethical manner of, quote, denying treatment, unquote, to a certain number of people. But normally, you have to deny treatment to some people because you don't have the resources to implement it for, 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 for everyone. There's a question also in terms of, uh, that was from Matteo again. Uh, there are questions uh, also in terms of uh, so I, I also see that, that, that there are some Star Trek fans out there, so that's nice. Um, I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, this is uh, Joe Cutson who, 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 uh, who, who's bringing up Uhuru, McCoy, and Scotty. So this is a real Star Trek, uh, the real Trekkie of the, the real Star Trek. But uh, the, the, the qualitative issue. This is, I think, I think that my, my two co-panelists here are going to agree that this is not a question of quantitative versus qualitative. It's a question of frame of mind. It's a question of thinking in terms of counterfactuals. An impact evaluation does not, I repeat, does not have to be something which is necessarily quantitative. Uh, indeed, if you actually want to find out about mechanisms, qualitative work is extremely important. And uh, economists who work on this, and there's also another question which was which is brought up. Um, it's further down in the chat, so it's uh, Beatrice Keller who asked this question, do you have to be an economist? Heck no, you don't have to be an economist to do it to do impact evaluation. Let me just give you an example, then I'll turn it over to my other panelists. So in a previous life, I was working in Brazil, uh, and I was in Salvador, Salvador da Bahia, uh, and I was working with the Instituto de Saúde Coletiva, which is a, 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 a public health center at the UFPA, Universidade Federal da Bahia, and we were working on a vitamin supplementation program in poor neighborhoods in Salvador. And uh, so my medical doctor friends were rolling out this program and they couldn't figure out why in Afro-Brazilian neighborhoods, uh, people were not taking this vitamin supplement. 
and it was really strange. I mean, the take people were just like refusing to take it. And so, uh, what do we do? Well, we brought in an anthropologist and the anthropologist went along with the people who were doing the vitamin supplementation pro pro program. And we realized the anthropologist realized, and this would have been obvious to any anthropologist who knew anything about Candomblé, which is Afro Brazilian religion. The pills were black and right, black, sorry, black and red. And black and red is the color of Eshu, the trickster, basically the devil. So people were not taking the pills that were being given them. They were not taking up treatment because they associated the color of the pills with the devil, essentially. Okay. So any, you know, undergraduate anthropologist familiar with uh, Afro-Brazilian religion would have noticed this. So heck no, you don't necessarily, you certainly don't want to be just economists. You want to have a multidisciplinary team to do an impact evaluation properly. On the other hand, you need a certain amount of statistical savvy if you want to do quantitative stuff. That, there's just no way around it. But there's, you know, there are a lot of data scientists out there uh, who can help you with this sort of thing. I'll turn it over to my, uh, my co-panelists. Either of you on, uh, on 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 this issue of qualitative versus quantitative, um, I think I think that's 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 a really really important yeah. important point. And in terms of counterfactual, no, as you have rightly pointed out that uh, I mean, qualitative methods will definitely help us understand more about the impact because the quantitative impact evaluation generally tends to answer question whether there is impact or not. But it may not be able to give good insight with how those impacts were uh, achieved. And this is a very crucial question for policymakers. So let's say you conduct impact evaluation and then you go to the bureaucrats or policymakers and say, okay, your program didn't work. The next question will be why it did not work. So let me give you an example. Let's say that uh, you are uh, asked to measure the impact of distributing textbooks to children in the schools and you and there is a theory that okay children will get textbook they will use it and there should be improvement in learning outcome and you conducted an impact evaluation and just okay so learning outcome did not change it's still the same okay but had you gone to the school and just have observation you might even observe that they are the kids were not using the uh, textbook most of them have not got the books. So if you have not accounted for monitoring data, you have not accounted for other observation methods or qualitative interviews with teachers. Now, so you will not be able to account why impact did not occur. And if you had done that, you may even go and say, oh, impact evaluation is not required. Your inputs are not at play. Output is not there. How do you even expect the impact evaluation? So qualitative inputs to a process evaluation or there is a technique called most significant change which try to you know talk to many stakeholders try to understand before you design the questionnaire or before you design the methodology that will really help you answer other aspects whether output was re uh, received because there is a theory of change of impact evaluation you give some input that is received as an output then this convert into outcome if there is a chain broken at the input and output level, then there is no impact. You don't have to do impact evaluation. That's over there. So it's really important to include other uh, collective methods or other evaluation design in your overall impact evaluation. Thanks, Shannon. That was, that's great. Uh, Edith? Um, yeah, no, no, I could not agree more. Uh, it's really the question about it's about you know what works uh, for whom and uh, in uh, in what circumstances. Um, uh, and I guess that Shanda has, um, has explained that very much and, and the importance of like the, the theory of change and, uh, and really understanding the overall, the overall context. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Edith. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch of other questions. Uh, some of these questions are sort of sectoral questions. So, for example, there's uh, Floriana Borino from the, the ITC uh, here in Geneva who asks about firm level stuff and trade related things. So uh, what we've been talking about is mainly things sort of on the household side or on the individual side. But when sort of, when we put sort of our statistical hats on, when we talk about an individual, we're talking about an individual uh, in quotes uh, and it's in the statistical sense. So that individual obviously can be a, a firm uh, as well as a, as a household or, 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 or a village. So there's lots uh, of impact evaluations out there looking at various trade interventions. So, for example, I don't know, a former student of mine 
this is this is responding to, to Floriana uh, directly, a former student of mine uh, who now is at the World Bank, who's looked at export promotion programs in Brazil. But of course, the sine qua non of this is to have good data, right? So, I mean, the the you know, in some sense, people who work on impact evaluations, be they economists or political scientists or whatever your field, uh, we're sort of like the FBI. Follow the. The FBI follows the money, we follow the data. Okay, that in some sense, that's the thing. You, you follow the data. If you don't have the data to do it, um, wh again, whether it's quantitative data or qualitative data, you know, you forget it. And, and this, this sort of brings me in some sense to a really important point, um, which, uh, which, which, which somewhere also responds to, uh, there's a question by uh, what if C2 who was asking about um, uh, you know, peace building and, and, and conflict situations. Uh, and uh, then there's, there, there's also questions uh, on measuring impact. This is Deepak Dungal also, who's, who's, who's from the, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. So there's a measurement issue, okay? So let me just be clear also, just let me give you an example of how important measurement is. So I quite often work on, uh, programs where uh, I'm looking for a synthetic measure of outcomes. And uh, as a development economist working in, you know, low income situations, my favorite outcome. So like when a journalist asks me, Jean-Louis, what's your favorite uh, development outcome? Well, my favorite development, and this always surprises them, it's child anthropometrics. So child anthropometrics, basically, I haven't done a survey in the past 20 years where I haven't systematically measured and weighed all children between zero and 60 months. Those of you who know something about nutrition and health know it's, it's basically because child anthropometrics, which is the measurement of the weight and height of children, there's that. You can do MUAC, you can do, you know, mid upper arm circumference. There's all sorts of other measures, but those are the main ones, the height and the weight. It's basically determined. We've known for close on to half a century, 75 years. It's determined by household income. It's determined by uh, maternal education, we're talking about literacy, not PhDs in, in, you know, in statistical physics. It's determined by basic access, you know, access to basic services such as clean water, basic health care, and it's, it's determined by female empowerment. Those are the, sorry guys, but, you know, we're completely irrelevant when it comes to child health. It's female empowerment, which is, uh, which, 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 which is important. This is, I mean, this is sort of like a statistical fact, okay? But there are two main measures that are used of, of, of child anthropometrics. One is what's known as WAS, weight for, weight for age, okay? And there's a Z at the end because our American friends call this weight for age Z-score. If you speak correct English, it's a Z-score. But uh, I'm just, you know, giving a hard time. I'm Canadian, so I'm giving a hard time to my American friends. And then there's HAS, which is height for age, Z-score, okay? So just think about this for a second. Suppose you're using these as outcome variables and you're looking at a program and you evaluate the program a year after the program started. Do you think anything has changed in the height of the kids? So if you're using height for height for age has, you're using that as your outcome, you're never going to find anything because in one year, you know, there's not going to be a, a heck of a lot of a difference in terms of outcomes in terms of height. But any of you who have kids, I got three of them, you know, if a kid doesn't eat for two, three days, especially when they're a baby, their weight can go way down really fast. So Weight for age is a very good short-term outcome. Height for age is a very good long-term outcome, but it's really bad as a short-term outcome. So, you know, you may not find any impact of a program, even though you get all the methodology right and everything, but if you don't pick the right variable to measure, you can completely miss things, completely miss it. So I remember, this is again, 20 years ago, evaluating a program in, um, evaluating a program in, uh, in, in, in Senegal where um, uh, what the World Bank was interested in was income outcomes. I said, no, 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 let's do income, you know, actually household expenditures, but let's also bring in child health. And boy, were they happy when we found no impact actually of their program on, uh, it was a, it was a community driven development program. We found no impact of their program on household expenditures, but a massive impact on uh, child health and the mechanism through which it was working was female empowerment to a large extent because the program was basically given women giving women uh, greater access to income generating activities. So the the whole point that I'm trying to make here is that you know if you can't measure it and again 
when I say measurement, it doesn't necessarily mean quantitative. It may be through some kind of interview process, you know, some sort of semi-structured interview. You know, focus group, one of the hardest things to do properly in the field is actually to run a focus group. There are actually very few people who can run good focus groups and actually extract information and not, you know, basically superimpose their views on the group, right? I mean, actually extracting that information is incredibly difficult to do. So I just wanted to bring up this point in terms of measurement. Measurement and whatever you're looking as the, at, 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 as at the, the outcome, this is particularly important when you're looking at things like peace building. How do you measure this stuff? It's very, very, very difficult to do. We, in terms of peace building, we have macro indicators. You know, we have PRIO, ACLID data set on conflict events, but this is so aggregated that it's almost, it's almost, you know, useless from a, from a, from a policy perspective in terms of, you know, current policy. Similarly, it's very difficult to collect data in conflict situations. So I'm working with the G5 Sahel right now on figuring out ways in which we can do quick and dirty impact evaluations of various interventions by the countries which are which are trying to help in the G5 Sahels. You know, when I talk about the G5, again, for those of you who don't know the terminology, G5 is basically Mauritania, Mali, Burkina, Niger, and Chad. Okay, so, so basically the, the Sahelian strip uh, in Africa. And this is where, you know, data such as satellite data on nighttime luminosity on vegetation, et cetera, which exists at a very high level of resolution can actually be a useful way of trying to figure out how interventions are uh, are working. I think, uh, so Chandan brought up the, the issue of measurement, especially when he yeah. was talking about employability. So I'd like to turn it over to him because uh, he has some really interesting experiences in terms of the measurement issue. Yeah, so thanks, thanks, Professor. Yes. So as you rightly pointed out that if you don't measure well, then how good your design is not going to matter. So, and measurement issues occurs at many levels. So the first is defining a proper outcome indicator. If this is not properly defined, so as I was highlighting earlier that I'm trying to measure impact of a skill development program. And what I have put as an outcome indicator is the uh, employment rate. Now, when I see economy of India, so in recent year, there has not been a lot of increment in jobs. The job creation has been slightly stagnant. Then, if I go and measure that as outcome indicator, and I attribute that this uh, job outcome was changed because of the program, it's not a justice, because jobs is also depending on many macroeconomic factors, investment level, how economy is doing, and even if it is at a state level. So it makes sense to measure the thing which is being changed by the project. So we designed a employability index because entire project aimed to measure improvement in employment. So it's then we should stick to that. We should was increasing or not. So we build an index and then we have this is how we did the measurement. So this is the one issue, uh, one thing at the outcome uh, levels. Now it does not in there. So impact evaluation requires a lot of data. You conduct a primary survey. So once your outcomes are defined, you need to develop a questionnaire. And even at this level, you can make a lot of issues if you are not uh, you know, careful, because sometimes the questions are framed, like, do you think, you know, this kind of, so if you frame a question like that, you are going to get a response, which may be slightly biased, or there could be element of social degenerative biases. So that can again lead to measurement issues. So once you make the questionnaire, pilot it, check, uh, comments from sector uh, expert also try to strengthen it so that the uh, measurement issue because of the poorly designed questions is not there. Also, as long as you can observe things on your own, don't ask. If you can really observe an uh, uh, outcome indicator, do observe and note. You don't have to ask because some indicators like uh, income and expenditure, if you directly ask a household their income level or expenditure level, income is always going to be underestimated and expenditure, expenditure is overestimated. And a lot of literature on this. So we do not ask this directly. We don't take a list of all the household assets. We try to estimate on our own so that we get a better reliable estimate. So just that level. After you have a questionnaire, you need to train investigators. Because if you are conducting a large scale survey in developing country, let's say you have a large sample size, you're not going to do survey on your own. You need a team to do the survey. And if you do not train your investigator properly, then, then you're not going to get good data. So the essence here, the conduct a training program, which is suitable in length, properly trained. 
investigator, make them really understand the objective of the program, make them really understand all the questions, how they should be asking, how they should be entering, right? Earlier, we used to do a paper-based survey. Now, this is a CAPI, this computer-based or laptop-based or tab-based survey. So, tab-based survey, this digital platform has come and then it completely eliminates requirement of data entry. Otherwise, earlier, we used to have a lot of data entry problems. So, you go collect data from the ground level and then the data entry guy you know, could not uh, enter the data properly. So, there again, there will be issue. So, what we used to do earlier that we make them enter data twice. So that the chances of error is reduced. Then the, when the investigator go to the household or at the field level to collect data, it is important to have very rigorous monitoring uh, mechanism to observe how they're asking. Or even at supervisor level, somebody can randomly pick few household and take the data you know, which was captured by investigator and then match. Nowadays, we can call even the household and again recheck the uh, no, variable re reported by the household. So if we don't do all these uh, activities, you will not get proper data. And no matter how good your design is, you are going to either underestimate or overestimate estimate your impact. Thank you. That's, that, that's extremely clear, Chandan. Thank you very much for that. Let me, let me just go to a few more questions which we have in the from, from the audience. So um, there was there was one question in terms of this is from uh, Obiagulu uh, Yonar uh, on a contribution by project. We have another question uh, from Jeannie Sebakunzi uh, in terms of behavioral change, and then we have a very explicit question from uh, my fellow Star Trek fan Joe Cutson uh, on uh, uh, difference in differences. So let, let me just take a shot at all of these sort of in one in one sort of answer, and then I'll I'll come back to to, to Chandan on this because I'm sure he has he has something to say on either all three, but pro probably on at least two of the three. So uh, again, the 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 question by uh, Obiajulu uh, in terms of in terms of quote contribution unquote that's the whole problem here is how do we attribute the thing right? And the whole point is. Again, it's through a it's through a counterfactual. So you'll see quite often various organizations, and I'm pointing my finger actually at a whole bunch of organizations, which in their what I like to call propaganda material. You know, I don't. Know, you have a school building program, and it'll say, and it'll say impact of our intervention, and it says, well, from this date to this date, we built this number of schools. That's not impact. I'm mean, not saying that it's not important. It's super important that you built a bunch of schools, but that's not that's not impact because how many schools would have been built in the absence of your intervention, right? So if you actually want to see impact, what you have to do is you have to compare it with a counterfactual, and before and after counterfactuals, which is what a lot of organizations are implicitly using, as well as politicians are using can be absolutely terrible. Let me give you a, 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 a real world example. Let me go back to one of my first impact evaluations is 20 years ago in Senegal with the World Bank. So we were looking, our outcome variable was child anthropometrics, so child health. And uh, this was a, a sort of a, this was a CDD, a community driven development. This is bottom up uh, type, uh, type, type intervention uh, where we were the, basically the program. I say we because when, when you're evaluating something, you get really in, involved in the stuff, right? You start, it's, this is the whole problem also ethically that you're maintaining an arm's length, right? At the same time, getting collaboration of the project management team. It's, it's a delicate balance that has to be struck. But anyway, let me, let me continue with this. So we followed households and children every six months. This is back in the, in the, in the dark ages. This is like 2001. Okay. And we were doing this on uh, on what were known in those days as PDAs, personal digital assistants. I should have founded a company there because we were doing it on PDAs 20 years ago. Now there are companies which do this, but 20 years ago, believe me, no one was doing this. But I'm yeah. not a businessman, so uh, you know that I, I I missed out on that. Um, I remember after the first two years, there was there was a midterm review by the by the bank. By the, when, when a development economist such as myself talks about the bank, it's the World Bank. Okay, so. Uh, Midterm review, and I remember showing the the, the project management team uh, in, in in Dakar, showing them. I showed them first what was happening to child health in the villages which were which were treated, the villages which were receiving the program. Okay, and what one saw on the graph was child health was going down, 
And the guy says, Jean-Louis, you can't show this to my boss, because if you show this to my boss in the treated villages, this is before and after, child health is, deter is deteriorating. He'll fire me. The guy ended up get, getting fired, but that was for embezzlement. It had nothing to do with, uh, with, with what was going on in the program. And I remember telling Mamadou, and this, this is an answer to, uh, to, uh, to the, uh, the question in terms of diff-diff. Before and after is not, I said, Mamadou, this is, this, you haven't understood anything about the counterfactual. Now you will. Because this was in the days when you still had transparencies. Those of you who are old enough, you remember you have this, like, this transparency and you superimpose one transparency on another. What was going on? In the counterfactual villages where the program was not intervening, the deterioration in child health was even worse. Why? Because the world is a complicated place. Senegal is a complicated place. And during those two years, there had been two bad harvests, two bad peanut harvests okay? for various, for various reason, reasons. So child health was getting worse everywhere, but it was getting less worse in the places which benefited from the program. So if we would used before and after to say whether the program was working, we, the answer would have been, we're killing babies. The actual impact of the program was to save babies. It was actually, and the quantitative effect was to increase Ceteris Paribus. Economists are, are a bunch of barbarians, but we know one Latin expression, and it's all things else held equal, which is Ceteris Paribus. And Ceteris Paribus, the program was actually increasing the height for age score of kids. Over two years, we could see an effect on height by one, by one standard deviation. It was a massive positive effect of the program. This is an example of diff-diff, of difference in differences. And to answer the, the question of Joe Cutson here, what are the weaknesses of diff-diff, and he's looking at, uh, at, at Kyrgyzstan uh, in, in the, his specific question, the weakness is you have to make sure that you have parallel trends. Okay, again, we can send me an email, Joe, if you have a question on this, uh, you know, at, at these breakfast, uh, the, the, these breakfast uh, uh, sessions, you know, we basically give a money back guarantee. You know, you contact us, we'll answer. It may take a while, but I'm sure Chandan feels the same way as me. You know, we're passionate about what we do. So you send us an email or, you know, a DM, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you. But the point is you have to have parallel trends. Chandan, I'm going to shut up and let you say something about this because I, no, know no, no, I, no, I saw no, you I, smiling. No, no, you perfectly uh, answered those questions. I don't take anything. I don't I agree with you completely on this point. Just a minute. There are there are a whole bunch of uh, of um of other questions. So there was also a question in terms of behavioral change before and measuring behavioral change. So before I, I get to that question, let me just give you sort of give everyone a another sort of like a general point that I'd like to that, that I think is important. And I I, I think I, I'm actually I'm sure Chanan will be will be on board with this one, and and and, and so 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 with Edith. Um and that's the difference between correlation and causation. Okay, so let me give you a concrete example. So right now I'm doing some work with the, the Brazilian Ministry of Health and the and, and the World Bank uh, mission in Brazil on COVID in Brazil. And as you know, Brazil is 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 in dire straits right now in terms of the the, the COVID pandemic. I mean, Brazil and India are the two countries which are doing worse actually right now. And so one of the things that you notice in, in, in Brazil, so we have data from the 5,570 Brazilian municipalities, daily data on new infections and you know, new deaths, cumulative deaths. Be that as it may, one thing that we see is we see a very strong positive correlation between deaths and GDP per capita at the municipal level, okay? So basically, if GDP per capita at the municipal level is high, deaths are high as well. If GDP at the municipal level is low, deaths are low as well. So does this mean that the richer you are, the more people die in your municipality? Heck no, it does not mean this. That's correlation, right? There's a whole bunch of other things going on. In rich municipalities in Brazil, uh, just as in rich districts in India, uh, or, or, you know, what's going on is that the richer you are, the more there is in terms of economic activity. So there's more contact between people and there's a whole bunch of other characteristics. So for example, emergency room beds 
There are a lot more of them in rich municipalities in Brazil than in poor municipalities. So if someone falls sick with COVID and gets transferred to, uh, you know, a hospital, likely what's likely, what's highly likely is they're going to be transferred to a hospital bed, which is in a rich municipality. So causality is something which is in the eye of the beho of, of, of the beholder. It's like beauty. Causality is a concept. When you're saying, when you're making a causal statement, you're saying, I press on this button, this is the causal effect that I get. That's what we're trying to do in an impact evaluation. But our data, be it quantitative or qualitative, all our data allows us to do is to establish a correlation. And unfortunately, and contrary to what you may have heard, this is true both of quasi-experimental and experimental uh, interventions. Because again, let me, let me come back to that, that example I gave you earlier about the, the, the black and red pills uh, and the vitamin supplementation pills in, uh, in, in, in Bahia. That was an experimental design, right? It was an experimental design. But just because your, quote, treatment status, unquote, okay, just because you're either treated or untreated. So suppose that I, you know, I give you a pill, you don't like the pill, or you think it has bad side effects. You may tr find a way not to take that pill, right? Similarly, if you think that whatever the treatment is, the pill is good for you, and you're in the control group, well, maybe you'll find a way to buy the pill from someone who actually got it, right? So people's behavior is a, compl is a, is a complicated thing, right? And so depending upon the context you're in, uh, again, this is, this is a, personal, a personal standpoint. People like Jay Powell and the two years ago Nobel Prize, uh, Esther Duflo and, 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 and Abhijit Banerjee and, and, and Michael Kramer, these are, these are people who basically only believe in experimental designs. Okay? Uh, I'm in sort of, in some sense, the minority of people who, who believe what's important is not the method you use. It's actually evaluating things with whatever method. It has to be a rigorous method, right? It can't be just before and after. But the key thing is getting things to work better. Uh, and there's a point that Chandan brought up, uh, which is um, an important point, and that is you don't just want to know whether a thing worked, you want to know why it did or did not work. And, and that's actually really hard to do in it. In some place, it has to be built in <coughs> to the, um, built into the, to the evaluation. There's a point I think that Chandan is, is, is very, very much qualified to answer. I'd like to get him in on this. And that is, when should you start thinking about an evaluation uh, when, you're, when you have a program? My answer is before you even start the program. But I think Chandan has also some, some, some good points that he yeah. can make there. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So, yes, as you rightly said, the best time is when you think of intervention. At that point of time, you also think of your evaluation because that will allow you to do a baseline measure of your key indicators. And if you have a proper design or you are able to found a, find a counterfactual also, you can take a measurement of uh, outcome indicator at the baseline level for the both group. So that is really uh, you know, ideal scenario to have an impact evaluation as soon as you think about your program. But most of the time it does not work. So what I have observed, especially in developing world, that uh, generally donor or governments, they will roll out the program and once program has matured, now they will think about what happened to my program. So with this kind of approach, uh, I mean, many important impact evaluation design cannot be used. So your DID may not be able to use because you do not have this uh, baseline data, even pre post cannot be used. So at best, what you can do, you can uh, find a counterfactual using uh, maybe matching methods and all, and then you can give a you know, attribution uh, element of the impact evaluation. But as your professor was uh, saying that uh, DID, difference in defense or any control, any uh, baseline and inline design is important because it also helps you negate difference in the group because of unobserved heterogeneities, which is basically means that your treatment group or your control group may be similar in terms of observed characteristics, like you know, their income level, education level, their other demographic uh, condition, but it is also likely that your treatment group people or control group people are different in terms of motivation. They have they have a strong will to make their life better. So this kind of uh, differences in the group cannot be, uh, no, cannot be cancelled 
using a matching method. So there is a challenge. So that is a limitation if you do not think of uh, impact evaluation while rolling out the program. Thanks, Janna. There, there's, there's a very interesting question here by uh, Inge van der Brugge. Uh, again, I hope I didn't butcher your name too badly. Um, and it's on whether RCTs can be ethically defended in situations where you basically have some type of vulnerability criteria, which determines whether people get, get the, the, the program or not. The, my point here would be, this is a typical example of where an RDD of a regression discontinuity design is, is, is exactly what the quote the doctor called for in the sense that you have an explicit criterion or a set of criteria, which determines who gets it and who does not. But the sine qua non of doing this, uh, but you'd have to do the same thing even with an RCT or even just using some sort of difference in difference is that you have to collect data on people who are not treated. You have to have a counterfactual. That's the key thing. Okay. So when I do an impact evaluation, my normally my best friend in the impact evaluation is the is the is the the M and E specialist, right? Any program, project, or intervention has an M and E specialist. M and E is monitoring and evaluation. Actually, an M and E person does not do evaluation. They're they're what what are they doing? An M and E specialist is following treated people. That's key, right? That's that's their job. Okay? In, in, in French, the term is suivi evaluation, but there's still that term evaluation. But an M&E person, their job is not to actually evaluate the program, it's to follow the people who are treated. The M&E person's job is not to follow the counterfactual. So an M&E person who ends up quite often being my best friend in, a, in an impact evaluation, because this is a person that I have to know really well because she or he is gonna be the key person in terms of collecting information on treated individuals, but that's not enough. It's a necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition. You also have to collect information on your counterfactual and the counterfactual are people who are not beneficiaries of the program, okay? So we're back to that problem of having the treated people and the untreated people, you have to have the darn counterfactual. And if you don't have the counterfactual, you're not gonna be able to do this. So in, in, in the example, which is being, uh, which was being given by, uh, by, by Inga, I would, I would think that this would be a key thing in terms of doing, uh, uh, an RDD that sounds just like, but the problem is still collecting data. The other thing is if everyone in a country, so suppose you don't have any resource constraints and everyone gets treated by a program at the same time, there's no counterfactual. Okay, so that's an easy one in term, in statistical terms. But normally what you will have is that programs and projects and interventions will be rolled out in an uneven fashion, quite often geographically around a country, even if it's a national program. And quite often what, you know, the people doing the statistical work trying to evaluate these programs, what you try to do is you try to exploit this staggered rollout simply because administrative capacity is never homogeneous in even a small country, I mean, I've worked on stuff, I don't know, like in, in Rwanda or in, Bur in Burundi, uh, even in a small country like Burundi, there are huge differences in terms of implementation capacities in different places, in, even in a tiny country like, uh, like, like, like Burundi. So uh, the whole point is there's normally is some heterogeneity that you can exploit. I don't know if you have some, some ideas about this, Chandan. We're running out of time, by the way. I'm no, no, so yeah, I agree. And so also, even if the RCT, there are designs like Bayesian designs where they try to cover everyone. So, and they do not just leave the control. So, there are other methods also that they can include. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a point also here being made by Luciano Monti uh, on uh, how can we verify that the two parallel universes? Well, we can't. That's the whole problem. The world is an extremely complicated place. Uh, this is all, the, again, the, the most important thing in some sense, and for those of you who are not statistically uh, minded, um, my suggestion is that you make sure that you understand one thing, which is really important to be able, so, so that people, I apologize for my terminology, but so people don't bullshit you, okay, if you're not statistically minded. You have to understand confidence intervals, okay? That's, that's, in some sense, you should not be allowed to vote if you don't understand confidence intervals. You have to understand confidence intervals. When, when someone gives you a statistical result and says, this is the impact, okay, you know how in some countries, when there's like a political poll which is given, 
and it says this poll is you know was conducted on you know 1017 in individuals between such and such a date and has a margin of error of plus minus 3% uh 99 times out of 100 okay so saying the margin of error is 3 plus minus 3% in a poll where, where the, the the outcome is a, is a is a percentage 99 times out of 100 that's a precise statistical statement so if if the poll said 58% of people will vote for you know such and such a person right uh in 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 the upcoming election when it said plus minus 3% 99 times out of 100 that means that that's the 1% confidence interval so let me use statistical jargon jargon okay and if we assume a normal distribution 99% of the observations are going to be at 58 plus minus two times the standard deviation, well, the standard error here, which is what that 3% is. So it's 58 minus six, okay, which would be 52, to 58 plus six. You do the math, that would be 64. So with 99% accuracy, 99 times out of 100, I know that the true number is between 52 and 64, okay? So in this case, you say, okay, yeah, 52 and 64, that's pretty close, yeah, 58's there in the middle. But sometimes, sometimes, and this is the whole point of statistical significance, confidence intervals are really, really large. So the number you're being given is to a large extent completely, you know, it doesn't tell you actually anything. So the statistical accuracy of the measurement is something really important. So if I have one suggestion I want to give everyone, understand confidence intervals. We've just run out of time. Uh, sorry about this. So. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone who's participated in this, Chandan, Edith, uh, for, uh, for, for at least, I always have fun in this stuff, but I love teaching. So of course I, I love this sort of event. Chandan, I really wanted to thank you for, uh, for, for, for joining. It's a lot later for you than it is for us, but at least uh, given that we're doing this in the morning in, uh, in Geneva, it's not too, too late for you. Edith, also thank you very much for, and she has family responsibilities to take care of. Um, <laughs> the uh, the event will be uh, available on the YouTube channel of the um, of the uh, of, of the Graduate Institute, so you should have no trouble finding find, finding this. I also want to give a special thanks, basically, to the people behind the scenes who actually make uh, the lives of the panelists extremely easy. So uh, there's a whole bunch of people. Who have, there are three people. There's Sabrina. Uh, Sabrina, Lena, and Pascal, who made this, uh, who made this happen. You don't see them, but we know who they are. And uh, thank you, thank you very much for uh, for helping us with that. I'll I'll leave the last word actually to to Chandan. No, so thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it was a really uh, very interesting discussion, and uh, I was glad to put my perspective. And also, we had some very good question from the participant. So it's great learning. So I would like to thank everyone, and including uh, the people who made our life easy, as you were mentioning, by taking responsibility of managing this entire event. So thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you for everyone. So let me uh, sign out from uh, the uh, the Graduate Institute in in Geneva, and look forward to seeing you in the near future at another uh, another Graduate Institute PWC event. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.